2 Timothy chapter number 3, I want to begin reading in verse 16. The Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Our hearts been blessed. Lord, we can truly leave right now and say it's good to be here. We've got to help already. But Father, I pray you'd help us now from the Word of God. We know it's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. We know that the entrance of thy Word giveth light and understanding to all them in the house. God, we need help. So enlighten our minds. Lord, may the seed of the Word of God grow deep in our hearts that we might uh, increase our faith. Lord, we understand that so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So grow our faith tonight. Increase our uh, ability to comprehend more of you. And then God, help us to go out and share you with a lost and dying world. Lord, thank you that we got a Bible tonight. And Lord, thank you we got a Bible we can trust in. And thank you, Lord, for being the God of the Bible. Now have your will and way now, and we'll bless you for it, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray, amen and amen. Before we get to the study tonight, and I've got a lot of ground to cover, and I'll go as quickly as I can. I always feel like I'm rushing these things on Wednesday night, but I've got a lot of ground to cover. But I want to, can I just share something with you that kind of vexes me? Uh, verse number 17, the Bible says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnish unto all good works. I've heard, I don't know how many independent Baptist preachers use that word truly and says, say thoroughly. Now, can I help you with something? God knows the difference between thoroughly and truly. He pinned down truly. He didn't pin down thoroughly. And a lot of people say, well, they mean the same thing. No, they don't. The word thoroughly simply means uh, uh, completely or entirely. Now, does not the Bible says that the men of God may be perfect? That word perfect does not mean sinless. I've taught you that already. That word perfect means to be complete or to be whole or mature. So it says the man of God is to be perfect or complete. So why would God be redundant and put thoroughly right after that if it means complete or entire? No, the word truly means without reserve. It means sincerely. That the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly furnished, unto all good works. In other words, without reserve, sincerely. I can stand up here and preach this book and teach this book without reserve because I know it's God's Word. I do not have to doubt if I'm teaching you heresy. I do not have to doubt if I'm teaching you something that God's not pleased with. I am without reserve and I can be sincere when I stand and I open the bread of life because I know it's God's Word. Truly is there for an important reason. So I just thought I'd throw that out. This is one of them pet peeves of mine. Um, just like when people say angels rejoice over sinners that repent. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angel over one sinner that repents. Angels don't, re they don't rejoice. They don't understand it. The Bible says they look into this thing unawares. They don't understand what it is to be saved by grace. They don't understand why Jesus died for our sin. Mm, so who's rejoicing? That crowd that's already went on before us. Phil's daddy and my grandpa and all that crowd that's already there. When somebody gets born again, the Lord says one more is in the fold and they rejoice. All right, that's another pet peeve. I'll never get this done. All right, let me give you a few things about the Bible. Can we talk about the Bible tonight? And we'll get back to uh, verse uh, 16 and 17 here in a minute. But uh, let me give you some facts about the Bible. Now, this might uh, uh, be overkill for some of you. Some of you may know all of this, but some of you may not. But when we're all done, we're all going to know it, okay? 
There are 66 books in your Bible. Now, if you don't know the story Bob, about our dear friend, Brother Bobby Cato, and he's watching tonight with his dear darling wife and darling daughter. Hey, Brother Bobby, how you doing? We love you, brother. But I got to tell this story on you. There's 66 books in the Bible. Brother Bobby used to tell everybody that his Bible was 66 sticks of dynamite from the master blaster. Until one night he was in an airport, and he's running late, and he's trying to catch his next plane, and they uh, stop him to see what's in his briefcase, and he says, 66 sticks of dynamite from the master blaster. They said, say what? He said, my Bible, my Bible. It's got 66 books. That's what I call it. They said, you said dynamite. Hmm? They ushered him off in a little room, and now he's a little more cautious when he uses that terminology. But there are 66 books in the Bible. There are 1,189 chapters in your King James Bible. There are 31,173 verses in your Bible. There are 774,746 words in your Bible. You say, why is that important? We're going to be judged by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The longest chapter in your Bible is Psalms 119. The shortest chapter, Psalms 117. The longest verse is Esther chapter 8, verse number 9. The shortest verse, the one all the kids won in vacation Bible school, is John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Hmm? The middle verse of your King James Bible is Psalms 118, verse number 8. The two middle words of the Bible is the Lord. You find him in the first verse, you find him in the last verse, the very middle verse, the very middle two words is the Lord. And you'll find him on every page in between. Your Bible has two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament has 39 books, the New Testament has 27 books. And can I say the Old Testament and New Testament agree in one? The word testament means covenant or agreement. Mm -mm. The Old Testament is our schoolmaster. It taught us what the, it brought us to the knowledge of what sin is. The New Testament mm, lets us know what grace is all about. Mm? You wouldn't appreciate grace had you not understood sin. But let me give you some things about the difference. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament's a, a, a section of promise. The New Testament is a section of fulfillment. The Old Testament deals with types and pictures. The New Testament deals with reality. The Old Testament was about preparation. The New Testament is about presentation. The Old Testament gives the foundation. The New Testament gives the building. So that brings us down to a very important question. Who wrote the Bible? Mm, I've been asked that. Or, well, I've, I've been told. It amazes me how many people who never crack the cover of the Bible are such experts on the Bible. They'll tell you stuff like, well, you can't judge me. You're not supposed to judge. You ever heard that? Mm. The Bible says, judge not lest thyself also be judged. Huh? But they don't want you looking down and judging their sin, so don't. Just start quoting the Bible to them. Let the Bible judge their sin. Mm. But how many of you have heard this? Well, men wrote the Bible. You never heard that? I hear it all the time. Well, men wrote the Bible. Well, no, they didn't. The Bible was penned by 40 men over 1,600 years, but it was written by God. Look again in your Bible at 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of who? God. If you listen to the terminology I said just a minute ago, I said the Bible was penned by 40 men. Now, can I help you with something? This is a pen. It's a nice pen. It's not the nicest one I own, but it's a very nice pen. It writes very well. This pen has no thought of itself. Yet this pen can be used to write every thought that I choose to write. This pen is just an instrument. This pen can't control the ink that is in it. 
All it can do is yield itself to a hand, and the hand use this pen to produce thoughts and poetry and verse and songs and all kinds of things. Well, can I say those 40 men that were used to pen the Bible were just the very same thing, just an instrument. They did not pen their thoughts. You know how I know man didn't write the Bible? Because the Bible tells us how wicked man is. If man wrote the Bible, man would talk about how great man, man is and everybody is to be loved and everybody's to be included, everybody's to be accepted. There's no such thing as sin. Live however you want to. And when you die, you get to go to heaven. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You see, man was just the pen that God used. The inspiration for the Bible came from God and the Holy Ghost is the one that moved the man to pin down what thus saith the Lord. Second mm, Peter chapter number 1 verse 20 says this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, nobody wrote their own personal opinion. It goes on to say in verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God wrote the Bible. And can I just add this? When they used the terminology, man wrote the Bible. Well, God used men, but just not any man. Holy men. Men that lived above the rudiments of this world and men that lived pleasing unto God are the ones that God chose to be instruments that he would pen his word through. And so we see who wrote the Bible, the Lord. Um, well, how did we get the Bible? That's very important. Uh, there's really four ways that brought our Bible to us. First of all, the Bible came to us through inspiration. Look again in verse number 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means God breathed. God breathed our Bible into existence. Just like when God formed man of the dust of the earth and God breathed in him the, the breath of life and man became a living soul. God put words together, but he breathed this Bible into existence, and that's why this Bible is alive. That's why you can read a, a text a hundred times, a hundred first time, see something you never saw before, because this book is alive. This book reveals itself to you as you are ready to receive it. When you're a young Christian and you're on the milk of the word, uh, there's things that will choke you with this Bible. But as you begin to mature, this Bible reveals it to you on the level you are spiritually. This book came by inspiration of God. It is a God-breathed book. Let me just add this. It is an infallible book. This book is without error. It's inerrant. There is no way you can find any fault in this book. It all agrees with itself. Now, let me, while I'm here, the ones who are Bible correctors and want to correct the text, who will tell you the original Greeks, and any time you hear anybody say the original Greek, note that person, they're a Bible corrector. Nobody's ever seen the originals. It's very important to understand. When some knucklehead tells you, well, in the original Greek, some, uh, a, a body they've listened to has made that statement, and they've uh, grabbed onto that statement. Now they're using that statement. Nobody's ever seen the originals. Uh, so that's very important to understand. Uh, but what they will say is your King James Bible has over 30,000 errors in it. What they are referring to, if you look on just about any page in your Bible you'll find some little italicized words. Words written in script. What's that all about? 
Any time you translate from one language to another, and we'll get into translation in a minute, but any time you translate from one language to another, there's different syntax. For example, I don't know much about any foreign languages. I don't know much about English. I speak a lot of slang, and my wife hates when the word ain't comes out of my mouth. I can't win the argument, Brother James, as many times I've told her ain't's in the Bible, or ain't's in the dictionary. She don't, she don't buy it. Huh? But can I say something about languages? In English, generally you have a noun, then you have the predicate or the verb, and then you may have adjectives or adverbs or even some other nouns. But the verb usually follows the noun. In Spanish, it's the opposite. The verb comes before the noun. The syntax is different. Anytime you translate something from one language into the other, the syntax changes. And sometimes when you translate one phrase into another phrase in another language, uh, uh, the phrases aren't exactly the same. Those italicized words in your Bible is the words that it took for the translators to make it mean what it meant in the other language. It's very important to understand. If it didn't have the italicized words, then it would make no sense. It would just be a statement that did not make sense for us to comprehend the meaning. Those are not errors. Those are the very words that it took for our Bible to mean what it means in English, to follow after what it meant in Hebrew and Greek and Latin and Old Syriac and those other languages our Bible came from. So it's important to understand that very important thing. Uh, your Bible doesn't have any errors. It's inerrant. It's infallible. Your Bible will not fail you. Your Bible's your best friend, especially when you're in a valley. Hmm? So our Bible came through inspiration. It came from God. Our Bible also came through preservation. What does that mean? It was preserved by God. Listen. Let's just use a little hillbilly sense. If God tells the sun when to shine, if God flung the stars out there on nothing, called them all by name, if God tells the grass to grow, if God feeds the, the grasshoppers and feeds the ants and He feeds the mosquitoes, usually on us in summertime, if He feeds the cows, if He feeds the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, if He feeds the fish of the sea, if God never misses a, a, a funeral of a sparrow that falls from the sky, if God knows the numbers of the hairs on your head, if God knows the intents and the thoughts of your heart, God can preserve His Word for His people. People that don't believe in the preservation of the Word of God don't believe in God. Right. You need a bigger God. Right. But let me give you some verses on our Bible being preserved. In 1 Peter 1.25, the Bible says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Matthew 5.18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Psalms 105, For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Psalms 119, 152, Concerning thy testimonies, uh, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. In Isaiah 48, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now go with me to Psalms chapter number 12. The Psalmist chapter 12. I've used this many times in the past, but I'm going to just show you how the Word of God is preserved. Why is that important? So you can have confidence. Confidence in your Bible. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 12. Verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of, furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. 
Verse 7 says God's going to keep his word and preserve it from this generation when the psalmist pinned this down, when David pinned this down, and forever. He said the Lord's going to keep his word. Verse number 6 is very important. You ought to underscore it in your Bible, and I'll try to speak slowly now because every time I do this, some of you don't get it, and you see me after church say, what were those? Verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words. In other words, without error. Hmm? As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now, I've used this illustration. It's true. It's a biblical illustration. Silver is purified when it is heated. What happens when they got silver in a big cauldron, they heat it. As it begins to get hot, the dross or the impurities will rise to the top. The silversmith will take a ladle, he'll scrape off the dross from the top of it, and he throws it off to the side. And he keeps heating that silver and keeps heating that silver. And he knows that the silver is pure when he looks in it and sees his own reflection. Now, could I say God knew that the Word of God was pure when he looked in it and saw his own reflection? I told you, he's in the first verse, middle verse, end verse. Every, every page he sees himself. And you'll see him too if you get to looking for him. But the Bible says that it was purified. Look at it again. The words of the Lord are pure, pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now, the writer here is inspired to say the word of God, if, he, if God would have only purified it once, that would have been enough. But God purified it seven times. What does that mean? The Bible's come through seven major language translations. The first one was Hebrew. Nobody ever doubts the Old Testament text. Why? Because that was the foundation. The New Testament tells us how to be saved. Why do you think the, the devil attacks the New Testament so much? Because people get in that New Testament, they realize they're sinners and need to be born again. Well, it came through, first was Hebrew, the second was Aramaic. The third language was Greek. Now let me stop right here. If you listen to Mitch Knup's CDs, you'll find this out. The Bible was pinned down in the southern Greek. God's always been in the south. Sorry, Yankees. He's always been in the south. The southern Greek was the common man's language. When the apostles were inspired to write the New Testament, they wrote it in the southern Greek. So every man could understand it. They didn't use the hierarchy language. They used the common man language. It was written in Greek. First was Hebrew, then Aramaic, then Greek, then Old Syriac. After Old Syriac, Old Latin. After Old Latin, German. And the seventh language, the one where it was purified the seventh time, the most complete, the most pure that it would ever become was your 1611 English Bible. Now, if you go and study in some of those books that I talked about, what you'll find is King James decided that every man should have a copy of the Bible. Mm, Brits speak English. Most of them, if they could get a copy of the Bible which it was very rare, it was written in Latin. The Church of England would host its services in Latin. If you're in English, or uh, in Britain, and you speak English, don't understand Latin, you don't understand anything that the guy's saying. You have a real problem understanding why a guy's in a dress with his collar turned around backward, talking in a language you don't understand, and telling you to give your money, give your t uh, penance, give your whatever, to this church which came out of Rome. So King James was inspired to have the Bible printed in English so every man could read it for themselves. Thankfully, there was the Gutenberg Press, and now books could be printed in mass volumes and people could have a copy of it. So here's what James did. He took a hundred scholars. 
He put 50 in one part of the country, put the other 50 in another part of the country, and said, translate the scriptures into English. This is how you know God's in your King James Bible. After the period of time when they had translated every jot, every tittle, they come together, they brought the two translated copies together, and they matched perfectly. You can't get 50 people to agree on anything, let alone 100. And yet, it matched perfectly. Your King James Bible was ordained by God for English-speaking people. Now, can I say, two wicked men by the name of Wilcott and Hort uh, decided that there needed to be a different version of the English Bible in the 1800s. And so they used a corrupted Greek text. Their text came from the Vaticanus text. Your Bible came from the Texas Receptus. The Greek text was the Texas Receptus, which means the received text. And theirs is the Vaticanus text, which came from the Catholic Church, which omits many verses that's in your King James Bible. They didn't like it, they just took it out. And so they came up with their own English Bible and every false Bible from Will Cotton Hort's text all the way through to the latest uh, CEV or whatever the next BVD version that's out there all use the Vaticanus text. I have a little problem with Aaron's employer over there at the Creation Museum. I like going to Creation Museum. I understand they don't use the King James. They paraphrase all the, all the, te- uh, you know, the Word of God everywhere throughout is paraphrased. But when you come to that little Gutenberg press room, there's a copy of the Vaticanus text in that uh, case. I get vexed every time I go there because that's not where my Bible came from. If Ken Ham would get a hold of the real thing, look at how much good he could do for the gospel's sake, huh? Hmm? But our our Bible came from the Texas Receptus. The King James Bible is the only English version that came from the received text. Our Bible has been purified seven times. I don't need to look for another. I got the real thing. Remember that that Coke commercial, get the real thing? I got the real thing. Why do I need anything else? And by the way, I don't apologize for having the truth. Hmm? There's been a great attack on the Word of God in America. Yes, sir. You know, when I was a kid, you could go into different denominations and hear the King James Bible preached. You could go into Church of Gods and hear the King James Bible preached. You could go in the Methodist Church and hear the King James Bible preached. Uh, you could go into uh, uh, just about every denomination and hear this book preached. Not anymore. Many Baptist churches don't use it anymore. Many Southern Baptist churches. You're rare in this part of the country to find a Southern Baptist church that does use it. Down south, there's still some Southern Baptist churches that use the Bible. But not many. Hmm? A lot of independents are moving away from it. They think the way to get a crowd is to dumb down the Bible and dumb down the religion. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. We don't need to dumb down anything. We need to lift him up and exalt him through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. You never use the uh, the world's tactics to gain the world. The only thing that's going to change a heart is Jesus Christ. Uh, we, get, we got our Bible through inspiration, through preservation. God has preserved His Bible. But also through recognition. God's people have always acknowledged God's Word. Uh, go throughout the Old Testament. When the Word of the Lord came to the prophets, they did deny it came from God. Go in the early church. They didn't deny it came from God. It hasn't been to, except for the last uh, 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 really 75 years that people have doubted the Word of God. We've got it through recognition. It's just been recognized. Hmm. Matter of fact, you go back to my grandparents and great-grandparents, they didn't know anything else existed. Hmm. You go back and watch old movies, and they'll read the 23rd Psalm like the 23rd Psalm. You go to some of these new Bibles, I don't even recognize what they're reading about. 
I thought it was the Archie comic book for a while. I didn't know what it was. Goods, kids Google Archie, the comics. Uh, remember Sugar Crisp cereal? They put the Archie's record on the back of the box, so you'd buy the cereal and throw out the cereal to get the record. Well, you cut it out and you play it on your little record player? Kids Google what a record player is. Uh, but not only recognition, but we also got our Bible through collection. God collected all the writings of the ages and put them in one canon of Scripture. We call it our Bible. He collected all 66 books and preserved it. <clears throat> if you've got the right Bible, you'll have 66 books. You won't have an Apocrypha. You won't have the Maccabees or the, you know, any other E's in it. You'll have your 66 books books that were collected in canon of scripture let me say something else before we move on it just occurred to me in 1611 the bible was printed in english back then it, we know it now as what is called elizabethan english nobody has that in here this evening i doubt i have a couple in my office back there of Bibles written in the Elizabethan English. Uh, the S's look like F's, and the U's look like V's, and it looks different in the print of what ours looks like today. Our Bible is still a 1611 Bible, but in about 1762, Oxford brought out a version in this current print text. So we read it this way, but it's word for word exactly the same as the 1611. Hmm? It's just, by the way, if you get in Elizabeth, if you start reading it and start figuring out them characters, what they are, you don't have to read long, and all of a sudden your eyes adjust to it and you can read it. You can. Sometimes you've got to look back and say, well, now what is that saying? But you can read it. But this came out about 1762, memory serves me right. Oxford came out with this version, and every typeset since then has been this typeset, all right? So let me ask you, or let me give you some other things about the Bible. First of all, notice the Bible's authority. You've heard me say that your Bible is the absolute and final authority for your life. Your life ought to be governed by the Bible. But what is the Bible's authority? Well, first of all, it's the standard of truth. The standard of truth. Everything else must measure up to it. The Bible says in Isaiah 8.20, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Jeremiah 8, 9 says, The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them? Psalms 119 and verse 104 says, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Psalms 119 verse 128, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Psalms 119 verse 142, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. It is the standard of truth. And what else about its authority? It is to be received as God's word. When we read the Bible, it's just as if God is literally speaking to us. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God which ye heard of us ye received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. James 1.21 Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. In the authority of the Bible, it's also to be obeyed. 
Deuteronomy 11.26 says, Behold, I have set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. Jeremiah 7.23 But this thing command I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. Romans 6, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Can I say right here, right now, concerning that? There's a lot of people that cannot live a Christian life because they do not obey from the heart. Mm-mm. Uh, there's a lot of people, Brother Brian, have a head knowledge. They've been raised around it. They know what the Bible says, but they can't do it because if he's not in your heart, you can't obey from the heart. Hmm? It's just real simple. All three of my children have some of my characteristics. Some good, some not so good. They have my characteristics because they have been born of me. When you are born of God, you will start having some of the characteristics of God come out in your life. Because when He's in your heart, it's easy to obey. When He's in your heart, it's easy to know. It's easy to know when this book's being preached and when it's not. It's easy to know to be in a, in a situation where things are being done falsely or heresies being said, and something just tells you, hey, I know, that's not right. How did you know that? Because God lives in you and you understand the difference. The Holy Ghost will not bear witness with anything that's not His Word. And let me just say this, this always makes people mad. The Holy Ghost pinned down one Bible. He only uses one. I've had people say, well, people can get saved by anything. No. The Holy Ghost uses one Bible, the one He pinned down. Hmm? And I'll show you in a few minutes. We're begotten by this Bible, not by some man's philosophy. Hmm? This Bible is to be obeyed. Can I say something about the authority of the Bible? It is to be magnified above God's name. Psalms 138 verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple, temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. There are some adjectives we wouldn't think attaching to God's name. And why would we to His Word? He's magnified His Word above His name. And also, in the, speaking of the authority of the Word of God, it's not to be added to or taken away from. And we brought this out a few weeks ago, but in Revelation twenty-two eighteen, For I testify unto you, Every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Verse 19, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. It's a dangerous thing to mess with God's word. Hmm? There's a lot of men going to stand before God who handled God's word in deceit. You know how you can tell the King James Bible is the Word of God? Go to the front of it and look. There's no copyright. Go uh, to Walmart or any Christian bookstore if you can find one and open up the false copies. There's always a copyright in it. Every perverted Bible's got a copyright. You know why? Because somebody's making money off of it. You know what God said? Print this one as much as you want. Pass it out as much as you want. And there's nobody making money on it. Hmm? It's God's Word. We talked about the authority of the Bible, but let me tell you about the sufficiency of the Bible. Look again at chapter number 3 of Second Timothy. The Bible says in verse 15, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. What a blessing that these children, when they go to children's club, when they go to Sunday school, they're being taught the Bible. They're not just given cookies and Kool-Aid. They're being taught the Bible. It made an impact in Timothy's life, 
and it's making an impact in their life. What do you think we've seen about 15, 16 young people get saved last summer? Because somebody's been putting a Bible in them. Hmm? It says, And from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, the study of the Bible, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Can I say the Bible is sufficient for salvation? The Bible is what's going to bring you to the saving knowledge of Christ. The Bible is sufficient for protection from error. Can I say the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible? It will protect your life from sin and from error. Uh, The Bible is sufficient for teaching. I don't need a little quarterly, although I'm not against all those or some of those real good. I just need the Bible. Get up and teach me the Bible. Let me know what Jesus said. Hmm? Can I say the Bible is sufficient for Christian living? You want to know how to live a clean life, a life pleasing unto God? Get in the epistles and read them, and they'll teach you how to live. It'll teach you how to talk. Can I say this? There ought to be no filthiness come out of your mouth. The Bible says not to let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Huh? Uh, A Christian ought to never once be named in in some of those sins that Paul wrote about. We ought to not be named in in fornication and adultery and lasciviousness and and, and lying and all this wickedness. Uh, That's not the testimony of a Christian. That's the testimony of a sinner. The Bible will teach you how to live. Now, Brother Ray, if the Bible's being taught, and the Bible's being preached in church, and people come to church, and they don't live by the Bible, there's a real problem. Either they don't know the Master, or they despise the Master, and they refuse to live by what He says. Now, can I say, if you despise the Master, if you know the Master, Brother Phil, and you don't live by the way the Master, the Master knows how to get your attention. Matter of fact, Paul said, for this cause many sleep. In other words, God puts them in the grave. He said, many are sickly among you. There's some who were were diseased because they wouldn't do what God said. It's important to know what God says and how to live and to live. We're to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present day. Hmm? If people know you go to church, they ought to see a life that backs that up. Hmm? They say, well, I can't live perfect. Nobody can. But you can live godly, righteously, soberly. And if you do mess up, put your foot in a mud puddle, don't leave it there. You get it out, get it cleaned off. Go back to living right, walking right, talking right. You can live right. Holy Ghost lives in you. Brother Peter, somebody that continually just stays in sin and God doesn't judge them, the Bible says that they're they're, uh, uh, bastards, not a child. It's very important to understand you can't live in sin and remain there and the Holy Ghost live inside you. Somebody can just stay in sin all the time, the Holy Ghost don't live and say, well, Brother Doug, I prayed a prayer. I don't give a rip. If you're living in sin, the Holy Ghost don't live inside you. I mean, perpetual. Hey, the Holy Ghost don't let me live that way. And he's no respecter of persons. Brother James, why would he let you live that way and not let me live that way? I don't know where all that came from, but it didn't cost you anything extra. But it's sufficient for Christian living. Can I say it's also sufficient for Christian maturity? The Bible makes it clear to where to grow in the grace and nurture and admonition of the Lord. Hmm? Miss Noreen, you'd look awful silly if you come in here with diapers and a bib on and a rattle and a pacifier. And yet, I mean, you know, you're 29. You shouldn't, you're welcome. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be wearing diapers and a bib and, you know, all that stuff. I mean, you know, as, as Christians, we're to grow in the Lord. If you've been saved any length of time, you ought to know a whole lot more about the Lord. You ought to be looking more like the Lord. You ought to be aspiring more from the Lord. We're to grow. Nowhere in this Bible does it say we reach a point where we don't have to grow anymore. Hmm? 
I find the more I learn about him, the more I realize I've got so much more to go. I realize the more I see him and the more I learn about him, the more wicked I really am. Hmm? I've never understood folks, Brother Ray, just thinks they can come to church once a month and they're fine. I've never understood that. I, I can't get enough. Amen. And I've never seen in here where we arrive and we don't have to come to Sunday school. We don't learn so much, we don't have to come to Sunday school. Hmm. I, I just don't find it. I, I've looked. You know, we can just lay out whenever we want to and God will be pleased with it. Wrong. He won't. There's a reason that we don't have revival in this day and age, Brother Brian, is we've got a bunch of baby Christians. Folks have been saved 30 years, and they don't know any more about living for God today than they did 29 years ago. See, our lives tell on us. The reason some people's family won't come to church with them is because they know your life. Hmm? You know, when you start getting a little gray hair, you should be a little farther down the road, have a little wisdom about you. But when you've been saved a while, you ought to have some Christian wisdom about you. There's some things that shouldn't affect you like they did when you first got saved. You ought to be able to, you know, trust the Lord a little more. Depend on Him. Learn some things. And realize there are some things you don't need to be around because they'll drag you down. It's sufficient for Christian maturity. Well, the Bible also is complete. We find, in, again in verse 17, that the men of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible's complete. We don't need a third testament. The Jehovah's Witnesses will hand you uh, uh, their watchtower and tell you that you need that on top of the Bible. No. The morons, I mean the Mormons, will tell you, that, and they use King James Bibles. And they'll tell you, well, we got the King James Bible, but you need the Book of Mormon. No, I don't. God didn't have some angel by the name of Marconi appear to one man with a golden tablet and said, this is the next testament. Huh? As a matter of fact, if you know Joseph Smith's history, he was a gypsy. And his family went around from town to town, you know, scamming people out of money. And one night he went in a tent revival and was seeing all the excitement that was going on through the preaching and people excited about it. And then he seen they took up an offering. He said, there's money to be made here. Enrolled in a little Bible college, learned enough to make him dangerous, found some convert, some, some moron to come with him, became his scribe. And he went behind a sheet and said, oh, Marconi's appearing to me, write this down. And there are people that believe that, but they won't believe the gospel. Hmm? Uh, the Bible's complete. Not to add to or take away from it. Jude, verse 3, said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith, not a faith, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. There's not going to be another mm, testament delivered. We have everything we need until Jesus comes. Now what is the central figure of the Bible? Very simple. Jesus Christ. Luke 24, 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Verse 44 of Luke 24, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms. The entire Old Testament was written concerning him. John 1 45 Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write Jesus of Nazareth the son of jo Joseph John 5 39 search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life but they are they which testify of me Hebrews 10 7 
Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. It's all about Jesus. Can I say in the Old Testament, it's laid out that Christ will come. The Gospels are laid out, Christ is here. The book of Acts says Christ has come. The epistles, uh, 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 they state Christ came for these reasons. And then the book of Revelation, Christ is coming again. He's the theme throughout the Bible, or, or, or the central figure of the Bible. What is the theme of the Bible? Salvation through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.10 Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what? Or what manner of time? The Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ uh, and the glory that should follow. Ephesians 1.10 That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ uh, both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. Ephesians 3.11 According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Salvation's in a person. His name is Jesus, and that is the theme of the Bible. Hmm? Hmm? Now, can I say the Bible uses a lot of symbols? The Bible is referred to as light. You find that in Psalms 43, 3. It's referred to as a hammer in Jeremiah 23, 29. Thy word breaketh like a hammer. That's why a lot of people don't like preaching. Sometimes the hammer falls and it hurts. Hmm? It's referred to as the sword in Hebrews 4.12 and Ephesians 6.17. Uh, uh, it's referred to as the fire in Jeremiah 23.29. It's referred to as a lamp in Psalms 119 verse 105. It's referred to as the water in Ephesians 5.26 and the washing of the water of the word of God. It's referred to as honey in Ezekiel 3.3. 3, uh, 3, 3. It's referred to as the seed in Luke 8.11. Uh, and it's referred to in James 1, verses 23 to, uh, through 25, as the mirror. We look into the mirror of the Word of God. See, it's real hard to judge somebody else when you're looking at the Bible because it shows you you and all of your problems, huh? There's also the power of the Word of God. This is why it's important to have the right one. It is through the power of the Word of God we are born again. James 1.18 says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 1 Peter 1.23, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, or a false Bible, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Hmm? Can I say, the power not, not only be born again, through the Word of God, we find the power to grow, 1 Peter 2, 2. Through the uh, Word of God, we're cleansed, John 5, 15, 3. Through the Word of God, we're sanctified, John 17, 17. He said, sanctify them in thy truth. Uh, through the Word of God, uh, 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 we find the power to be built up in Acts 20 and 32. Through the Word of God, we find the power to defend against spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, 17. The power of the Word of God, we are washed in Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Uh, uh, through the Word of God, we find the power we're kept in Psalm. 17 4 uh, and through the word of God we find the power that will be judged in John 12 48 the word of God is a powerful book and then we also know the word of God is inerrant or it has its inerrancy it's without error you can trust it let me give you this I'll be done I've rambled but I'll be done how do we use the Bible it's not to collect dust on your coffee table it's not, to, and I can always tell who, who leaves them in the back window of your car because they curl up and not from reading them. Hmm? They're not to be left in the church. Do you know how? <laughs> you remember Brother Ray, Brother Randy, you remember when people would leave their Bibles and I'd charge them five bucks to the, they had to give to the, the building fund to get them back? You know, we'd collect them after church. Yeah, they'd leave them in the church house. We'd just collect their Bible. You want it back? It's going to cost five bucks. Put it in missions or building fund to get it back. Well, then people say, well, I've got one here, and I've got one at the house that I read. Hogwash. I've been preaching out of this same Bible right here for 32 years. This Bible's my best friend. I have, look, can you see that? 
I have notes on about every page of this Bible. When I don't have this Bible with me, I feel lost. I have other Bibles, but I have one Bible. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this one's my best. I can, I, I can go in my mind and I can see what side the, the Scripture, what page, what side of the page it's on. I can see notes that I've gotten written next to it. I, I, I mean, don't tell me you just, you just leave one here because you got one at the house. Well, you're not reading either one of them. All I got to do is tell you to turn to Hosea. Take you 45 minutes. Half the congregations went to sleep waiting for you to find a place in your Bible. Huh? You know, I'm telling you the truth. Well, how are we to use the Bible? Uh, there's some great books. R.A. Torrey wrote a great book on how to use the Bible. It's a great book. It's not very thick. It's only about 100 pages of it. It's a great book. How do you use the Bible? Well, can I say, first of all, you're to believe it. I don't understand everything in this Bible, but I believe everything in this Bible. The writer of Hebrews said it was through the Word of God we know that God framed the worlds. I just believe the Bible. I don't understand the Trinity. I don't. Three entities in, in one person. I don't understand it, but I believe it. Say, so preacher, explain that to me. I can't. But I also can't explain to you how a black cow can eat green grass and give white milk. There are some things I can't explain. But there are just some things I choose to believe. I believe the Bible. Hmm? I don't believe everything I hear out of Washington. I don't believe everything Fox News. As a matter of fact, I haven't watched Fox News since summer. I don't believe everything they say. I don't believe anything. There are a lot of, there are a lot of preachers They say things. I don't believe it. I'll go study and see. But I believe everything this Bible says. You're to believe it. Can I say you're to read it? The more you read it, the more you'll grow. The more you'll read it, the more you'll find help in time of need. Hmm? The more you read it, the more you know how to pray. You know how to live. You know how to witness. You know, I, I'm a firm believer, 98% of your problems will be solved if you read the Bible more. Hmm? I've had people over the years say, Preacher, do you charge to counsel people? Nope, just come sit down and I'll preach to you. That's the best counsel that I know. Hmm? We're to believe it. We're to read it. You're to desire it. How much do you desire the Bible? How much do you desire to read it and know its truths? How much do you desire to hear it preached, taught, expounded on? I don't know about you, but there's just some guys I love to sit there and just listen to them take this Bible and open it up and begin to expound on it. I think, man, man, what a gift. There's just some guys, they just, they just open that Bible and I just sit there and I think, wow. And then there are other guys, they open it up and they never refer to it again. So they turn in your Bibles, then they don't even turn there, and then they, you know, they, they never quote anything from it, never tell you anything. And I just can't wait for them to shut up. Huh? How much do you desire the Bible? You know, it's a lost art to find Bible preachers. That's why I love Sidney Weaver. You know what Sidney Weaver's going to do? He's going to preach this Bible. He's going to break it down. He's usually only going to read one verse. And he's going to break that thing down. And he's going to flood you from that verse. Hmm? And I can name other men that take this Bible and use it and do great things with it. They inspire me. If you give me somebody who's just going to use object lessons and philosophy, I'm going to go to sleep. Give me the Bible. How much do you desire the Bible? We're to desire it. We're to meditate on it. I don't care if you read 20 chapters in a day. I don't, know, I don't care if you read one chapter in a day. Read one verse, grasp what it says, and then meditate it on, it on it all day. You'll be amazed at how far you'll get down the road. Oh, it would be a blessing if you could read 20 chapters and comprehend it all and apply it all. But start out with one verse and get a hold of that. Get your one promise. And then meditate on it. You'll be amazed at what God will do 
for you from the Word of God. Hmm? We're to hear it. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Jesus said, in the last days there would be a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. You know why a lot of so-called churches now have rock bands and fog machines and video screens and all this stuff? Because we live in a visual age. Everybody wants to see something. We don't want to hear anything. God chose for us to hear what he said. How many times did Jesus in his earthly ministry say, Verily, verily, I say unto you. That word verily, verily means sit up and pay attention. I know a preacher, he's in heaven now, but I know he did this. On a Sunday, he preached a message. On Sunday night, he came back, he used the exact same text, preached the exact same message, only reversed the points. Nobody in the congregation caught it, not even his wife. I'd have liked to have been there on Wednesday. Because people don't hear. And I get it. Because we are so inundated with life that our minds are going 100 million miles an hour. And when you sit down, you're thinking about what you got to do on the job, or what you got to get at the grocery, or what you got to get the kids here, and what you got to do there. And your your mind's constantly racing. And a lot of times, by the time you get to church, you sit down. That's the first time you've relaxed in a week. And you sit there, and your mind's everywhere, but except where it needs to be. Used to, I'd I'd quiz you every now and then. I'd come back on Sunday night and say, "Okay, what did I preach on this morning?" It was amazing how much people had to think about it. There's usually somebody in the crowd, that smart aleck sitting on the second row, he, he knows most of the time when I start to say something, he, he's telling everybody what I'm going to say before I say it. Because that's all he's done is heard his dad preach for 28 years. He's got one of the minds, he remembers everything. But most people, by the time they get to their car, they can't remember what the preacher preached on. So did we really hear it? And if you're honest, when you're reading the Bible, I know I catch myself doing this. I'll be reading the Bible and while I'm reading it, while I'm understanding what it says, all of a sudden my mind's thinking about something else i got to do. And then I have to tell the Lord I'm sorry, and I start back over at the beginning, and I go through it again. And bringing our minds under subjection is a very difficult thing. And if you're not careful, you won't hear even when you're just reading it. We have to hear what God's saying. How many of those churches there, in, in, in those seven churches, the Lord said, hear what the Spirit saith to the churches? We don't hear sometimes. And if you're a man, you're worse than a woman. Because we don't hear. You don't believe me? Ask my wife how much I hear. Hmm? Huh? Uh, what do we, what do we, how will you use the Bible? You're to hear it. You're to memorize it. There's an art to memorizing it. The older you get, it's harder to memorize. The best way to memorize is repetition. But you ought to memorize the Scripture. Why? It'll help you in your life. Can I say this? You're to obey it. Sometimes that's not easy. And many times it's not fun. Because there is pleasure in sin for a season. But if God said it, that settles it. You know, I've seen that bumper sticker. God said it, I said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, if God said it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. But you need to obey it. Thou shalt, do. Thou shalt not, don't do. Real simple. You're to receive it. Even when the preacher's getting all of your toes... You're to receive it and thank the Lord that he thought enough about you to get on your toes. A parent that really loves his child, he'll discipline his child. A parent that don't discipline their children don't love their children. 
When God disciplines you and I, it's Him showing us that He loves us. He doesn't leave us to our own conceits. You receive it. I don't know how many times a preacher preach something, people get mad. Well, that's his opinion, not if he's preaching the Bible. I'll say this about Brother Bob. He's not here tonight, but I'll say this about Brother Bob. In those days when I do have to throw down the hammer and I have to preach a hard message, in those days I don't sleep much before I preach it. Because many times I'd rather take the beating than preach something real hard. But those times when I've had to preach hard messages, usually after service, Brother Bob will hug me and thank me for caring so much to preach a message like that. That's a blessing. A lot of preachers don't get that response. You're to receive it. The Word of God, what are we to do? How will you use it? We're to speak it. It's amazing we can tell everything about every episode of our favorite show, but we can't tell anybody anything about the Bible. And we use that excuse, well, I'm afraid I'll mess it up. Hey. Hey. Don't try and tell them things you don't know. Just tell them what you know. <clears throat> I don't know how to lead anybody to Christ. So just tell them how you got saved. That'll work. And then the last thing. How do you use the Bible? Love it. You ought to be so grateful you got the Bible. I've told this story. There's a pastor in Asheville, North Carolina. His name's Ralph Sexton, Jr. I heard Brother Ralph preach in the 80s, so we're going back. And Brother Ralph was talking about how he went into uh, parts of Russia. And he got to see an underground church. He said and when the guide, the, the preacher they met over there, took him down, there was a man who was weeping uncontrollably, and he thought the fellow had a child die. He was weeping that much. He said, what's wrong with him? He said, oh, tonight's his night. His night for what? That church, that underground church, only had one page of the Bible. And each time they assembled, they let a different man read it. And that was his night to read to the congregation the one page that they had. And we've got the whole thing. I love it. I never forget Luther, Luther Spivey preaching from one time, preaching on kisses from heaven. He's blowing kisses to everybody from the Bible. Greatest love letter ever written. Uh, got to love the Bible. Uh, this is what's going to take you to heaven. You got to love it, but you got it. You got to appreciate it. You got to be thankful for it. You ought to esteem those that have been called to use it. And thank God for them. Pray for them. But they'll not use it deceitfully, but they'll use it to bring souls unto glory. You've got to love the Bible. You're privileged to have it. What a great privilege. Sometimes I feel, copy, I feel guilty. I've got so many copies of it, and yet there are some that have none. You've got to be thankful you've got the Bible. You've got to love it. You ought to be thankful you're in a Bible church. A church that preaches the Bible, teaches the Bible. You ought to be thankful. We're becoming a dinosaur. You ought to be thankful. Because I've learned this, you won't miss the water till the well runs dry. If you don't appreciate it, there's coming a time when uh, false President Biden signing legislation where you can't have that no more. I promise you, they're going to go after your guns, and then they're going to go after your Bible. Hmm. I already tried to shut the church down last year. It's only a matter of time before they get wicked men on the courts that let them. You ought to appreciate why you got it. As you get to where you take it for granted, God may have them taken away. You say, that'll never happen. Well, you haven't read about Nazi Germany, have you? I have heard this. History has a way of repeating itself. You ought to appreciate your Bible. Thank God we got a Bible. Maybe it's tonight you want to come. Thank God for your Bible. Maybe he spoke to you another way. 
Maybe you need to come and do business with God. There's a song out, the Henson family sings it. I'm going to make them sing it during campaign. It's called, I love the old Bible. I love the old Bible. Thank God for the Bible. Brother Clint, why don't you come get a song of invitation. Let's all stand. God spoke to you in any way, and you need to pray. We're going to give you that opportunity. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, we'd love to take this old Bible and show you how to be saved. You can get saved tonight. Maybe tonight you just want to tell Jesus you love him. Maybe God spoke to your heart and you want to go to somebody. Just put your arms around them and tell them they're a blessing. I don't know. You just mind the Lord. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the truth contained therein. Thank you for the privilege of having it. Help us to love it more. Use it more. Lord, help us uh, certainly uh, give ourselves more to it. And God, have your way in our hearts and lives. Bless these that have come tonight. Bless in this invitation. Speak to hearts. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.